Since everybody's over here today. <laughs>
We've researched it. We have a model picked out. We need to replace one of the three units. It makes little sense to replace it with the same type of unit we're using because we seem to get about three or four years out of them and then one by one they, they say, I'm, plus we need a better system. So we're going with that because the dollar amount for that, which is about $14,000, that exceeds 5% of our budget and by constitution we are required to have a congregational meeting for that. So we'll give you more information about that uh, next Sunday. Won't tie you up for long after church. Probably no more than 10 minutes to vote on that. If you have any questions beforehand, you can contact any council member, certainly including, including me as well. Thank you. All right. Um, on that note, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, 
who comes to set us free. Before God, we are holy and righteous, free to worship without fear. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who comes to set us free. With a heart full of mercy and compassion, God saves us and forgives us all of our sins. Christ, the dawn on high, from on high, shines upon us, and by the light of the Holy Spirit, guides our feet into the way of peace. Amen. Amen. of living water. You quench our thirst and wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows with the beauty of your truth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
The first reading this morning is from the 17th chapter of Exodus. The entire Israeli community left the wilderness of sin, moving from one place to the next, according to the Lord's command. They camped at Rephaphim, and there was no water for people to drink. So the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink. Why are you complaining to me, Moses replied to them. Why are you testing the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you ever bring us up from Israel or Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? In a little while they will stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take the staff you struck the Nile with in your hand and go. I am going to stand there in front of you on a rock at Horeb. When you hit the rock, water will come out of it and people will drink. Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read to Psalm 95 this morning responsively. Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in the song. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The sea is his, he made it. His hands formed the dry land. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, Where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I had di what I did. For forty years I was disgusted with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of Romans. Though we often hear that God helps those who help themselves, here Paul tells us, through Jesus' death, God helps utterly helpless sinners. Since we who have been enemies are reconciled to God in the cross, we now live in hope for our final salvation. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, because we know that the affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for just a person, or for a just person, though for good persons, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we boast in God through our Lord Jesus, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. The words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. Lord, 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 Lord,
called Skyre, near the, the property that Jacob had, had given his son Joseph. Joseph's well, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because the disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him, for the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket. The well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than other than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and as his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I, that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You are correct, said. You are correctly said. I do not have a husband, Jesus said. For you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is, at, is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then, his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. And he said, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say, there are still four more months and then comes the harvest. Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, this saying is true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. Now, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of what the, the woman said when she testified. He, did, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. Many more believed 
because of what he said. And they told the woman, no longer, no longer believe because you because of what you said. Since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is a savior of the world. Here ends the reading of our Lord and Savior. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, water, it can either quench our thirst, cleanse us, or take us out. It's very powerful. And you say that you give living water. Allow your living water to flow through me so your people may know that you are the truth and you are the spirit of truth. Allow the words from my mouth to be of you and only of you, so they may know you more, share you more, and ultimately love you more. And the church says, Amen. Amen. I truly, truly love the story of the Samaritan woman and Jesus as well. My favorite story in the entire Bible. It's so rich. It has so much in there. It's a rich conversation. You ever had a good conversation with somebody? You're like, oh, that was a good conversation. Because good conversation, they leave you with like good advice, you know, happy, um, uplifted, life-changing at times. Conversations are needed because we are communal animals. So back in 721 BC, I know I'm going back, right? Way back. Wait for we were all thought of, okay? Wait, wait back. Back in 721 BC, the Israelites were acting up, not listening to God, and God sent the Assyrians, and they defeated the Israelites. And when you defeat that man, when you defeat a country or a people, what you take their booty, right? You take you take their good stuff, you take their women, you take everything that will benefit your culture. So, the Israelites had to go to Assyria, and some had stayed in Jerusalem. And within that, the Jews intermarried with other races, which included, now we know as Samaritans. And Samaritans and Jews, even though they are related, they have the same ancestors. They do not like each other. They consider, the Jews consider the Samaritans as half-breeds, and they also consider them as a false or dirty religion because within the intermarriage, one religion intermarried with the other religion, so they combine. So when the woman speaks to Jesus about worshiping, and we worship here, you say, oh, praise and worship is there, this is, where, this is where that comes from, okay? So there is deep-rooted discrimination between the two. As a matter of fact, they would go around Samaria in order not to go through that town, add extra four days onto their schedule to travel just because they did not want to go through Samaria. And they would eat off each other's plates. It, it was just nothing that they had in common, so they thought. And when the Jews came back to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem, the Samaritans opposed it, which gave greater opposition between the two. So this is deeply rooted, especially the word half-breed. What does half-breed mean? Anybody? What does it mean? You're half this and half that and, and not either one. Not either one. I remember the first time I was called a half breed. It's not a good thing to call someone. Okay? And I was called a half breed because I am black and Puerto Rican. And guess who called me a half breed? A family member. So here you have family members 
discriminate against each other. So this understanding of discrimination of half breeds is, is not something of the past. It still flows. Okay? So here, here comes this conversation. Jesus sends the disciples away. He needs to talk to this woman. And she was a little sassy, wasn't she? Jesus says, give me a drink. I'm like, who are you <laughs> to uh, ask me for a drink, Jewish man? Okay? I'm a Samaritan woman. Are you kidding me? And as a matter of fact, you don't have a bucket. So how are you going to get anything out of this? Because I got the bucket and we ain't sharing the bucket together that you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. That would be breaking the law. Another thing, too. How is it that you, a man, speaking to a woman in public that's not your wife? How dare you cross that norm? How dare you do that? That is breaking the law. You don't do these things. How many laws do we have to put up in our own selves to discriminate against other folk? How have we treated the genders, and especially within church settings and, and, and daily life, within our culture? We have women and men issues here, misogyny and all that. So there's nothing new, okay? But these dams that we build holds back the water that we need. So here is Jesus bringing the dam of women not talking to a man in public. That broke it down. Water started to flow. Here Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan. That dam is broken down. Water started to flow. He says, if you knew exactly who you were talking to, you would have asked him for living water. And the woman's like, oh, where do I get this water from? Because let's face it, she's coming here at noon, which a woman's not supposed to travel alone at that time. That is hot time. You think Texas is hot? No. <laughs> this is hot, hot, okay? So here she is by herself going to a well to let you know right there and there she's not really respected in her hometown, okay? How many women who live skinless lifestyles are respected? So here you have, not, not, not that Jesus just picked a, a woman or Samaritan, he picked a scandalous woman. So here goes that dam breaking down. Water starting to flow. And I love when we, <laughs> when I speak to people, I was in LA and I spoke to a lot of prostitutes and pimps and drug dealers and things like that, I knew they were telling me the truth about their life. They had nothing to hide. There was nothing, look, look, it's real, it is what it is. I, I'm a prostitute, I've done this, I've done that. Here, this woman saying, listen, I don't have a husband, I ain't, you know, and a man I ain't, you know, I'm not my husband. She's like, you know what, you are correct. So you need to break down the dam of Lying to ourselves. Be honest about who we are in the presence of God. Be honest about who you are. Don't come into worship in fakeness. Be honest of who you are because the Lord already knows. He already knows. It is us that built that dam to say, we don't want you in that part of life, even though we know we can't hide anything, but we still try to hide it. We still try to hide. Like Adam and Eve, they, they still try to hide it. God already knew. So this conversation allows us and tells us, be honest with the Lord. It's okay. He knows us. He knows you. He knows all the things you have done said, didn't do, things you probably haven't done, you know what nobody knows about. But the Lord says, you need to come to me and be honest. And this woman was honest about her life. 
And, and, and you see, the more that she was honest, the more water starts flowing. He's like, you know, you're correct. Because you have five husbands, and then you know, you know, I don't like your husband. And she's like, how could that man know this? We even, we ain't exchanging names yet. How could he know this about me? So that triggered in her, this must be someone from God. This must be the prophet or the Messiah. This is somebody, she knew that this was somebody from God. Because she went straight into, where do we worship at then? Where do I praise you at then? Basically what she's saying. How do I praise you then? Where do I do it at? How can I do it? Shall I be Luther or Baptist? Because you got to be busy than that. Or Episcopalian, or NAMB, or non-denominational. We have different ways of worshiping. And sometimes it can get very confusing. And God and Jesus say, listen, God is not looking for Lutherans, Baptists. He's not looking for Episcopalians, non-denominational. He's not looking for denominations. He's looking for spirit and truth. What is spirit and truth then? Do you think you worship in spirit and truth? Who here thinks they worship here in spirit and truth? No one? <laughs> Well, maybe I don't know. I'm here. You know, I, I'm here. But spirit and truth. Spirit means freely. Freely, no boundaries. Nothing hindering it. Whether it's old or new, it doesn't matter. As long as it, spirit felt that my connection to God is there. My connection to God is there because God is spirit. So we, Jesus said to her and to us, get rid of the baggage of we worship this way, we worship that way, or we don't say that, or I'm used to saying this, or uh, anything like that. Get rid of that attitude and be open to the spirit of God, which leads us into the truth of God. That God is love. And that God's love, this living water, breaks down all the barriers that we set for ourselves and for others in society. Because you see, it touched a lot of areas of our society. It touched church. It, it touched what it means to be a man or a woman. It touched what it means to be biracial. It, 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 it touches everything. And what I love about this story, which I didn't realize, I wrote, I wrote an article for the Welka website about this story. When I was writing it and reading the story over again, what really had me understand what living water was is the fact that the woman left her jar at the well. She left it at the well. That the water in the well didn't matter anymore. Her life has been changed. And her life signifies that basin of water. And she said, no more. I'm leaving this behind because I have met someone who knows me, who hasn't judged me, who hasn't put me down, who I can be honest with and still be told I am the Messiah. That is crazy because Jesus never really said those words, but he said to this woman, I am he. So whatever, this is a powerful conversation because now Jesus is saying, I am God. And he tells other folks, don't call me that. Don't say that. But he declared to her, this scandalous woman, 
they had five husbands that, that, that lived with a man that wasn't her husband who had to come at the middle of the noon time to come to get water the hottest time. He told her, I am God. Powerful. Powerful. I am God. I'm the one talking to you. And she said, my encounter with God means I leave my life behind and I go to the same people that, that told me I wasn't nothing. And I said to them, you ever hear me tell your testimony? I can do that. You know, have some testimonies told up here. Because the thing about living in water is you can't keep it in. It has to flow. So here, this living water, this woman said, I gotta let this flow to other people, even though they got on my last nerve and did me wrong. We don't know why she had five husbands. She may have been beaten and all this comes. We don't know. Doesn't matter. She didn't keep the living water inside of her because he explained it to her. It, when, the living water I give you will burst out like a spring in you. And it did, because she went and told people, come and see the man and do everything I did. Could he be the Messiah? Come. We want to tell people about Jesus. Come. Come. When's the last time you told some folks about Jesus? Come. Come tell. Tell the story. Tell your testimony of how Jesus has brought you from here to here to here, maybe back here and brought you back here, how Jesus is in your life. When was the last time you told someone that? This is what Jesus called us to do. Tell people about how I changed your life, how you no longer have to come back here for water. Now you can come back here, get some water, but then you can come with other girls, hanging out. You know what I mean? You might get a respectable man now. If not, no man, cool. Your life changes when you encounter Jesus. That little water changes us. And in this Latin season, that's where God is calling to change us. To break down the dams that we have built for it to be plowed down by his living water. By his spirit when we worship. And by his truth that leads us to justice. This is what God is saying to us during Lent. Come to me. Those who are thirsty, who are hungry, who have skinless lives. Those which is all of us. Come to me and I will give you living water. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and not seen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, to bring him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was excarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. We pray for your church. Bless partnerships with other Christians and interreligious dialogue. Guide the daily work of denominational and congregational leaders. Strengthen our combined witness for the sake of the gospel that all experience your life-giving love. Merciful God, we pray for the universe. All creation teems with life from the depths of the earth and the seas to the skies above. Fill us with awe and reverence for the diversity and preservation of life. Merciful God, we, our we pray for the nations of the world. Topple the dividing walls that separate us from our neighbors. Form us into your beloved community where diversity of gender, race, language, ability, and ethnic origin is celebrated and affirmed. Merciful God, we, our we pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Be present with all who are lonely, and give courage to all who are afraid. Comfort those who live with chronic illness or other sickness. Give them your living water always. Merciful God, we, our prayer. we pray for this congregation, especially for those preparing for baptism. Nurture their faith and pour your love into their hearts. Inspire our community by their testimony to God's grace in their lives. Merciful God, we give thanks for the lives of all your saints, their hope in you sustained lives of faith and service. Encourage us with the hope they shared in you. Merciful God, at this time, you're welcome to offer your joys and concerns, either aloud or silently. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. God of good gifts, Jesus, 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 Jesus,